My name is Father Gregory Pine, and welcome back to the Thomistic Institute podcast for this most recent episode of Off-Campus Conversations, the point of which is to follow up with the Thomistic Institute speaker who will have given a lecture on campus or contributed to a Thomistic Institute conference, so that way we can deepen some of the insights which were introduced in the context of that lecture, follow up on those thoughts, and uh, see what we can do to continue the conversation and maybe, uh, yeah, commit more as it were to the discourse. So for this episode, very delighted to be joined by Professor Lewis Ayers. Thanks so much for joining. Ah, oh, thanks very much, Father. Um, yeah, my name is Lewis Ayers. I'm a British Catholic theologian who has been lucky enough to teach uh, in Britain and also in Ireland and for 10 years in the US. Um, so uh, I've been lucky enough to see quite a range of different institutions and places and problems. Um, one of the consistent problems that you see in attempting to see to teach theology in just about any country, I think, is that modern students are very much formed by post-enlightenment uh, suspicions of tradition and suspicions of habit. And one of the ways of understanding what it is that I was trying to get across about tradition is to think about what it is that the post-Enlightenment period has rendered so difficult. And that is not the value of specific traditions, but the Enlightenment made it very difficult to see tradition as a generative and necessary feature of human existence. Um, so many of the great Enlightenment thinkers see themselves as simply overturning what has gone before, of freeing people from tradition. And this general atmosphere has had a huge effect on the way that modern people think. Now, philosophically, as well as theologically, especially within a Catholic context, there are deep problems here. And it's probably worth beginning just to think philosophically in general about how human beings function. Um, one of the really foundational works that led to the development of modern writing about tradition is a French work by a think thinker called Félix Rabesson, who was writing in the 1840s um, about the nature of habit. And what he does is to say in a, in a small book simply called on habit. You can find it on Amazon. There's a lovely new edition and translation into English. What he does is to say, well, in the modern world, and he means in the early 19th century, people have come to see habit as a bad thing, which needs to be broken so that you can move on to the new. But in fact, habit is the condition of possibility for normal human existence. In order to be a good and virtuous person, you must develop certain sorts of habits. If you want to do well at school, you develop habits of study. And those, in fact, are just intrinsic to what it is to be a human being. And what Ravesson is doing there is really showing you how habit and inhabiting traditions of practice and thought are an essential feature of good human living and not simply something to be questioned. Now, if you move forward to the 19th, late 19th century and think about uh, Catholic theological context, you find really significant and rich debates about the nature of tradition, in which a number of thinkers are trying to encourage the, the church to think about tradition not simply as stuff that is passed on in the sense of a tradition means that we cross ourselves in this way while in the East we cross ourselves differently. But a tradition is primarily a, an atmosphere that in which we inhabit. It's a way of thought which fills us and enables us to read and understand that which comes before us. So a tradition is almost an instinct. And you find a wide variety of different words being used to try and describe what tradition is. Um, now, it's very, very important for the good thinkers amongst this group that somehow there's a balance between tradition as an instinct and tradition as something which also involves commitment to things which have been handed down to us. So to put things very simply, um, we exist in a church 
where we believe that the spirit has guided Christ's body to make certain sorts of dogmatic pronouncements, and those are a gift to the church. So one doesn't say, well, I have an instinct that they might be wrong. Rather, tradition is the sort of inhabitation of those statements, an inhabitation of the liturgy, a living with the church, and gradually coming to recognize as part of the whole communion of the church how certain decisions are made and how certain beliefs are held and how sometimes new decisions are made in different contexts. Now, of course, to speak like this is theologically, it's very rich because it demands that we speak about how the spirit works in the body, but it's also very complex. And that's where we get to, I think, the question that you asked, Father, that's really, really central. If you think of tradition only as stuff, it becomes reasonably easy to pin it down. You can say, well, that's part of tradition and that is not. But once you recognize that at its deepest sense, tradition is a Catholic instinct held by the church and inhabited by those of us who live within the church, we struggle to live within tradition. It's much more difficult to pin down. But if someone were to say to me, is it too complex? I think what I'd say is, well, think about the spirit. It's very difficult to talk about exactly where and how the spirit leads us and the church. But we must speak in that way. We're given a language by scripture and tradition in which we must emphasize that the spirit leads the church and us. And we're engaged in a process I hope, of constant discernment of how that works. But it remains very hard for us to see it in individual instances. Of course, sometimes it may become frighteningly clear, but for much of the time it's very difficult. And tradition is just like that. Tradition is at root a feature of the Spirit's work within the community. It is difficult to see, but that doesn't make it not real. Okay, I want to follow up on a couple of the things that you just described there in that opening salvo, which is great. Um, so I guess a, a first thought is, all right, insofar as the tradition is content rich, but also formally speaking, more of an instinct, uh, we can speak of, you know, formal and material elements, which taken together contribute to the tradition, which, uh, we in the life of the church receive and then subsequently communicate. Um, so I'm thinking here of the way in which we can be more deliberate or intentional in our approach to that, uh, because you see different approaches. And I think one step is probably being conscious of this present evil age, the secular world, and its controlling paradigms vis-a-vis -vis tradition. So you mentioned this post-enlightenment piece. I'm thinking of the American context, insofar as I'm American, I don't know how widely this is shared, you know, in... Um, the United Kingdom or, you know, on the continent. But like, it seems that Marxism, uh, you know, it, it kind of had its go as a political movement. It's in somewhat of a decline in the last, I don't know, 45 years. But it seems as a cultural, societal, academic movement, it's really picking up steam. Um, and, you know, one of the kind of basic principles of Marxism is that you have this oppressed underclass and it's going to seize the means of production to overthrow their uh, lords, as it were. Um, and you see that transposed into various registers. So I think we can we can see some of this in the way that people will approach tradition. Are there ways that we can be more critically conscious of what we're importing from the culture and then the way that we're deploying it in our faith discourse, or are we just are are we just destined to be storm tossed and shipwrecked? I hope not. Uh, yeah, there are certain <laughs> things where we have to think very hard. And one example from history that I think is still deeply pertinent are the uh, debates um, which became known as the modernist crisis at the very turn of the 20th century, where you had a, a, a few thinkers um, who were so enamored of the idea of progress that they embraced the idea that, of course, progress is the most important thing of all and tended to embrace a very um, secular and simple evolutionary view of development such that you would find arguments of the very general form, well, we are now in the modern world, therefore doctrine X or Y um, cannot hold because it is of a different world. And the church quite rightly 
um, had to point out that that notion of simple and inexorable evolution and progress uh, it is not a Catholic principle. The fact that doctrines slowly emerge and in some sense develop is very different from saying that ideas necessarily evolve and therefore the church should do X or Y simply because that seems to be a modern evolution. And one of the things that I think we need to be really critically aware about is how we balance the importance of real development and emergence um, within church teaching, which is always a discovery of more of uh, the mystery, which remains the same. How do we differentiate that from a simple belief in, belief in evolution and progress? Um, and I think that, you know, one of the great marks of modern society, um, perhaps, or at least it should be, uh, somewhat under threat, given the nature of our world and what human beings do to each other, is this sort of endless belief in progress, that somehow technology will save us, that the world is becoming more and more fair or equal, um, or whatever particular slogan you like. But there are elements in that which can certainly be characterized as coming from a Christian context, certainly. But there are also many elements which are deeply against a Christian and Catholic view of humanity, the presence of sinfulness, and the complexity of us being attentive to a revelation that has been given to us, whose depths are being unfolded, but which doesn't change. So that's one example where we need to be critically aware of the sorts of discourse and cultural assumptions that are around us and learn to question them. Okay, turning then from the cultural societal setting to our own uh, personal obstacles or impediments that need to be overcome in entering into this type of conversation. We've all had the experience of conflict, right? Being corrected by somebody or confronted with um, a weakness or uh, a limitation. And ideally, we respond like, thank you. I am blessed by the knowledge that you cared enough to communicate this thing to me such that I can grow by it. But I would say that that happens in like negative 0.1% of the instances of said corrections. Usually, you know, I feel my temper flare up and then I just try to like buffer myself existentially from any foreign threat. And so in the moment, I don't know how committed I am to the truth of the discourse. I know that I am committed to myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you kind of wield arguments as it were as a way by which to defend yourself from the onslaught of one who would call into question the excellence of your existence. And, and, and sometimes, I think too, when we approach the tradition, we feel some of that tension. There are things that we want to be true of the tradition because it would correspond more with our own temperament or presuppositions or whatever it is. And then we try to source it in the tradition in a way that can sometimes be responsible. And, you know, everyone's imagining a different argument at this point, but there are lots of examples of them. So are there ways that, you know, as, a, as an individual, you know, you think about this, you spoke about the person in the pew who has access to this revelation, this tradition via faith. You spoke also about the theologian who has a particularly learned approach to it, albeit again in faith, are there ways in which we as individuals can be more cognizant of our engagement with the tradition so as to be more honest? I think that's a really, really good question. And I, I find that um, to be a really important question when uh, I am teaching. At the moment, I teach in a very diverse context where some of my students are Catholic, some of them are Protestant evangelicals, and some are people who are fascinated by theology, but just simply don't know where they stand. Um, and I, I, I'm teaching an intro to theology at the moment. And there's a particular guy um, who always sits at the back of the lecture hall. And he always stares at me. And I know that he's going to come up and ask me a question. And his questions always have the same form. They always have the form of, Professor Ayres, you said X and Y but I actually think Z, and I just don't find what you said persuasive. And he will, he will say this, whether I'm saying um, the Catholic Church says this, and here it is, or I'm saying this is what I think. He tends to assume that his response as a student to every situation is to sit quietly and work out how he would put it together himself. And some of the best conversations that he and I have 
when as you know i'm in that 0.1 percent of the state where i don't think oh please leave me alone um are <laughs> uh, where i can say to him how do you think you should make theological decisions how do you enter into a world of learning if you were being taught in a math class it wouldn't be much good for you to come up to the front and say i don't really like the way that you've done that logic um now there are obviously places within theological learning where you can have multiple perspectives and that's fine and you bring uh, evidence and text to bear and you say well i would rather have this rather than that after all i'm speaking to a dominican how would the conversation be different if i was speaking to a franciscan um let alone a jesuit um <laughs> there are different traditions of theology and that's fine but there are some points at which your duty as a student is to try and enter into what has been said and not first of all make a judgment about it but to enter into it and to try and understand how that could be the case how it links to other ideas and i think one of the most important principles that that we need to cultivate in ourselves as learners is attentiveness to what has been the case and why it makes sense and of course that's true if we're reading um a a non-christian author as much as a christian author it's a preliminary step um but i think it is particularly important if you're a christian thinking about how you inhabit um the church one of the ways in which we inhabit the church is by thinking hard about how what the church says makes sense even if to us at first sight it seems problematic it may be that what we need to do is to keep quiet for a while and just think about it and i think this is one way in which the nature of our public discourse at the moment is not always the most helpful um everyone has a blog uh you read your favorite blogs and then you write comments where you shout yay or nay and there's not a lot of thinking going on and i think that's really destructive of our conversation as as christians as well as as citizens of various different countries but i think that we have to think about how we cultivate an attitude of study whether we are just a, a normal member of the church or whether we're a student of theology um and that's not a habit that we are taught well i think um but i think it's absolutely essential yeah i i'd like to follow up Right, so the immediacy of contemporary discourse poses certain problems to an appreciation of the tradition. I'm thinking of a line from Chesterton, which I will now paraphrase poorly. He says, you know, when you come to a fence in the wood, you should ascertain what it's keeping in or what it's keeping out before you tear it down. Um, like you're kind of counseling, not like a hesitancy or a caginess, which I think some people accuse the Catholic approach tradition with because it's like, oh, of course you got it right because you waited, you know, a billion years to make any solemn declaration on it. But, but, thinking about that more in terms of how it corresponds to human recognition and reception of God's revelation and grace, like it's not insignificant that he made us discursive, that he made us time-bound, that he made us unfolding. So could you say a word maybe about the correspondence between how God reveals himself, how we're meant to recognize and receive it, and then what that entails for tradition? Yeah, I think this is a feature of the talk that I gave that's really, really important. Um, and you know, I'm a great devotee of uh, at least the early Yves Congar and uh, Henri de Lubac. And there's a subtle hint there. We may want to come back to that. But <laughs> one of the things that I think is really important is that when someone like de Lubac in his, uh, I think, rather important 1948 essay on the nature of development, when he says, y yeah, what is taught is not to be understood as the bits of the mystery that we can now put clearly, but rather teachings which are both true and which always refer to that which is mysterious. There's a really central balance there. We're Catholics. We believe in the fact that God has communicated himself to the world and that we now have a teaching that we can preach. Um, and that means that it's, it, it's true. And it's a teaching which calls us to further intellectual investigation as part of the restoration of human thinking, of the human mind. But that doesn't mean it's not also a teaching which reveals to us the sheer mysteriousness of 
God and that what we think to be obvious and simple in fact has a depth and a beauty and a mysteriousness that lies beyond our comprehension. So the clear teaching of the church should be that which leads us towards mysteriousness. And I think that that balance is absolutely essential. The more you understand that, the more you are likely to find yourself in an attitude of struggling to understand what has been taught and declared and recognizing that probably elements of it will also lie beyond your comprehension. Um, and it's important for us to sort of cultivate that attitude. And perhaps the central place where this occurs in Christian theology is the mystery of Christ as one person in two natures. There's a great deal which may be said, and that the church has said, about the nature of Christ as one person in two natures, and that's really important. But from a, from a central angle, what the church has said is to narrow down and point our attention to that which may remains utterly mysterious to us, that the Word of God has taken to itself in Mary's womb a body and a soul, and spoken to us as a human being. That was brought about through divine power and remains beyond our comprehension. We grasp it, we attend to it through the gift of faith, but it doesn't somehow mean that we understand it fully. And I think there's a sort of model for all theological understanding. Yes, the church speaks. Yes, theologians struggle. We grow in understanding. And yet, at one level, we grow in understanding of the mystery. We learn to point towards the mystery. And I think that balance is essential. And if we can learn that, then we become better learners and better speakers to each other. Maybe even a tad more charitable, although I wouldn't want to hold myself up as an example there because it's a virtue <laughs> I seem to lack intellectually, I admit. Oh. Uh. Okay, well, let's let's follow up on a couple of breadcrumbs that you left in that last answer, uh, specifically with reference to Henri de Lubac and Yves Congar. You made a distinction between the early Yves Congar and the late Yves Congar. Um, in the comment where I live at present, last Lent, nope, last Advent, we read Etienne Fouillou's uh, <laughs> biography of Yves Congar, and then this yeah. uh, Advent, this past Advent, we read Etienne Fouillou's biography of Marie Dominique Chenu. Yes. Um, both of which were enlightening yeah. uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, the last chapter of the Chenu biography, I think it was entitled The Crisis, What Crisis? Um, so it was like in the years after the Second Vatican Council, after many of the Pariti uh, who had been deeply involved, and in his case it was largely with Gaudi Mitzbez and the crafting of these ecclesial documents, um, and then in their subsequent reception, they were made nervous by what they saw unfolding in the post-1968 dispensation. And so I think that a kind of nervousness in the past 50 years when appropriating uh, certain thinkers like Kangar in this instance and their work on tradition is that you fear that something is being snuck in the back door, um, like what's being recovered of the tradition is being recovered selectively or where the tradition is being directed is being directed sneakily. Um, so how can we, yeah, maybe in reading these 20th century thinkers and then the way in which their thought is appropriated by the Second Vatican Council, how help, how can we help to maybe put to rest some of those anxieties or be more responsible, I suppose, in then subsequently communicating what is true? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And it's especially important question for someone like, someone like myself, who's been very influenced by those thinkers. Um, in, in, in many ways, that set of French thinkers um, have a project that was incomplete and which failed. Um, there are all sorts of fundamental questions that they didn't really deal with. They had piecemeal answers to problems. And many of them, as you say, were just shocked by what happened in the late 60s and early 70s and didn't really know what to say next. Um, and I think that's in part because none of them, interestingly, really wrote an extensive program of study. Uh, Chenu's uh, little book from 1937 about what was going on at Le Salqua is really quite interesting, but it's just a hint. None of them really set out what theology should look like and what its various disciplines were 
and how they might interrelate. Um, and I think, you know, a simple example of this is that um, with Dave Verbum at the Second Vatican Council, um, people like De Lubac and Congar, in the end, thought they'd produced a compromise document, which, which wasn't at all bad, because it seemed to bring together the importance of studying the scriptures in the light of the spirit in which they were written, and yet some openness to certain sorts of modern scholarship. Well, what you've seen, what you saw, perhaps, up until maybe the last 15 years, was just a sort of headlong embrace of every new kind of biblical studies that came along. Um, you didn't see any real attempt at a synthesis between the way that early Christian and medieval authors read scripture and modern biblical studies. Now, I think as a sign of real progress, um, there are far more people now thinking about how those things come together, and that's a real sign of hope, I think, for our age. But it's not surprising that happened, because the pressure in different quarters towards Catholics embracing modern biblical studies was very strong, and none of the ressourcement figures really wrote seriously about how we might negotiate those problems. Um, and so I think their project, in some ways, was not, did not have enough foresight, and we need to go back, excavate in them what is really helpful, and then recognize that we have new problems and new struggles we need to think anew um so they are a great inspiration but in some ways you can't just do what they said because they said remarkably little about some of the great problems of our day um and I, but i do think that there are real there are real signs of hope if you look at the sorts of uh people now interested in recovering the theology of the fathers alongside the sort of ressourcement Thomists of the last 20 years, there are real opportunities for dialogue and progress and the creation of new ways forward that you wouldn't have thought existed probably in the 80s and early 90s. So there is real progress. Um, but yeah, it's been in some ways for theology a devastating half century. That sounds <laughs> <it. laughs> Devastating. Um, yeah. All right, I have... Maybe maybe one or two more questions. Um, so I'm thinking specifically about recovering the tradition. Um, I'm writing a thesis right now on St. Thomas and his treatment of the mysteries of the life of Christ. And it's a kind of easy criticism to make uh, after like 1999 that like this author doesn't consider all of the mysteries. Like this author just focuses on the passion or this author just focuses on the passion and the death. Um, it's like what became of, you know, questions 27 through 45 and then questions, whatever, you know, 50 through 59. Um, and, you know, I, I understand why those particular criticisms are leveled against certain authors because it loses sight of a, what seems to be a, a central principle for St. Thomas, namely that all of the deeds and sufferings of Christ save so that they all have some contribution to make and so that we should weigh them with that in mind. But also, like, when you do theology, you have to you have to pick things. Um, like, you have to pick what you're going to focus on or who you're going to focus on. And I think uh, when it comes to tradition, when it comes to reappropriating what has gone before, I think a lot of us feel the break that has taken place in the catastrophic past 50 years. And so we're not in a typically traditional posture. We're not receiving. We're, we're having to recover or, or we're tempted to invent. Um, and so you see some people reach back to particular patristic thinkers, and when you ask them why, it's like, well, I had a course, he was proposed, it was cool. You know, it's like we don't always have a good justification or foundation. So maybe, you know, from your, um, from your experience as a professor and as a student of many of these, these thinkers along the way throughout the tradition, are there ways in which we can embrace a more traditional approach whilst reappropriating or recovering the tradition that has been at times lost? Yeah, I think one thing that we really need to think about as students of theology going forward is how we see the relationship between historical theology and dogmatic theology or systematic theology or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, one of the things that often really gets me annoyed and makes me my most uncharitable is when I say something and one of my colleagues says, well, yeah, but you're a historian, and I do systematics, so that doesn't really matter. 
<laughs> or someone presents me with an argument. We had a student in a dissertation defense in the past couple of years. I better keep it vague. And um, this guy kept using the word Augustinian. And it became apparent that he was really smart. But what he meant by that term was something I would like to attribute to Augustine or his followers, but for which I have no textual citation. Um, <laughs> and this sort of this really winds me up. But it, and I'm making it, you know, I'm 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 being flippant, but it's a really serious problem. And it seems to me that for younger theologians, it's really important for us to recognise that the work of excavation, as it were, is also a task of creation. Um, and that it may be a task of creation and dogmatic understanding that is peculiarly needed in our particular cultural and theological moment. That, you know, it's no good you just writing an introduction to um, everything that all medieval authors have said about the nature of Christ's acts and their salvific value. What we need is detailed excavation of particular discussions, such as the one that you describe, so that we can become more familiar with the details of the tradition and the richness that it offers. Um, and we see that as a primary dogmatic task. That one of our primary dogmatic tasks is not the sort of one that someone like Rana sort of sketches for us in the 60s, which is Everyone has said X, but now in the modern context, I'm going to tell you how to redo X because that's my task as a theologian. Um, sometimes we best address modernity by excavating the past and saying, what about this? This is actually what figures in the tradition said. Yes, alongside that, we'll need experts who can produce genealogies of uh, modernity in its discourses. But we also need people doing the primary dogmatic work of excavating the past and presenting it to a new generation so that it does grab the attention of students who say, you know, Father Gregory gave me a talk about this question in the summer and it really grabbed my attention as a deep spiritual level. I want to study that. Um, that's how good theologians will be formed in the past, in, in, the, in the future and the present. And I think that one way in which we do stand at a different moment from the sort of resource mon figures that I, I, I mentioned and that you've been reading about is that for them, they tended to see themselves as facing a radically new situation in the life of humanity, which surely would demand something new. Um, and they weren't, I think, enough able to articulate. Delubac comes closest, but weren't able to articulate. Yes, we find ourselves in sort of late modern new situations. Perhaps what we need is just careful attention to what has gone before as an essential part of that dialogue. Otherwise, it becomes forgotten, or as Cyril O'Regan at Notre Dame often says, badly remembered. Um, and so I think that the work that you're doing is something that has to be recognized as an essential part of theology itself, not just a, a preliminary, not just messing around in the vestibule, but actually this is central. Okay, then maybe one last question, and it concerns, um, you know, taking on a master or being apprenticed by a master, because, again, thinking of our 21st century preoccupations or fussiness, uh, we, have, we have great difficulty with authority, with law, um, with anything as of or pertaining to hierarchical or um, aristocratic notions of, of governance in any domain, <laughs> or at least in the United States, such as the case, or so it seems. Uh, but it strikes me that, you know, even reading these authors, uh, this 20th century authors, whom, you know, some might be inclined to think kind of like progressive, liberal in the, the, the quintessentially modern or postmodern sense, a lot of them had masters. Um, among each other, you know, you think of Congar's reliance upon Chanu and his formation at the hands of Chanu, but also they're like they're looking to St. Thomas Aquinas in a pretty profound way, even as they're branching in different directions or exploring different avenues of thought. Um, so, yeah, is there is there a way in which our contemporary study of theology commends to us certain masters, other ways in which, I mean, this isn't just like a I bump, I set, you spike, and then his name is St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 
you know, are there are there ways in which we can search the tradition for masters that are less arbitrary mm -hmm. or just less strange, I suppose? Well, I, I, I think that's a really good question, and I'll give you two two answers to it. The first answer is that we should be very careful that we do not apprentice ourselves to masters that will not help us. And often the structure of higher education does that for us. It tells us that constant specialization is key, that uh, suspicion is key as a hermeneutic, that uh, a history uh, as if God is not present is the mark of good scholarship, etc., etc. Universities come with, in the modern world, a certain sort of set of presuppositions. And many students will be, will be half-consciously sucked into those, whether they're in a secular or a Catholic educational setting. So we as educators need to think carefully about what masters we exhibit to our students and what masters they're picking up from their surroundings. Um, and that's my, my first answer, a, a little obliquely. But secondly, yeah, I think it's really important for younger theologians to find an acceptable master to follow. Um, obviously, Thomas is a pretty good one. <laughs> but there are others. Um, there are others, of course. Um, Franciscans have some other guy whose name I just can't remember for the moment. <laughs> but but I think it's important for, sec you know, for secular students of theology like myself to find a master. Thomas is always a reputable master because Thomas has constantly been declared to be just such a master uh, in modernity, and that's a good thing. Um, but I think we need a plurality of masters. We need people who apprentice themselves to Augustine, people who apprentice themselves to Gregory of Nyssa, apprentice themselves to Gregory the Great. Um, and know that they are going to contribute a useful part of the Catholic conversation. They're not going to master it all. None of us are. And that's an important recognition. But having someone who really is one of those deep and rich thinkers and learning to inhabit as much as possible of their mind through their work is, I think, a, a key thing in the development of a theologian. And perhaps it fights against that that idea which often people have in doctorates, especially if they find themselves doing doctorates in systematics, where uh, they think that their job is to come up with something new, is they've done a few survey courses of the past and now their job is to say something new about problem X. Occasionally, occasionally, someone is gifted with the ability to do that, and it's a wonderful thing. But for most of us, it's far better to have a master and to stand on their shoulders and to do a little. And then I think we may find we've done more than we think. Yeah, certainly not nothing. <laughs> well, thanks so much uh, for having taken the time uh, for yeah unpacking the content of the lecture that you gave, but also following up some of those thoughts. It's profitable for me. It's helpful for me to think it through. Just, yeah, living in Europe for the first time, I, um, I've had difficulty just kind of identifying what it is that I'm experiencing. It's almost as if I don't have the vocabulary or the grammar for it yet. It's like, this ecclesial experience is different. I feel like we're approaching the church in a way that's different, but I don't know how. <laughs> it's very, it, it is very, very different. I you know I find that as someone uh, who lived for a long time in the U.S. and then came back to Britain. And there, there are subtle differences. There are big differences. There's often a sort of, how can I put this? It's a sort of defeatism. You know, the church is declining. We must manage that decline well. Right. Yeah, just, <laughs> that's just what Jesus said. But at the, at the same time, there are just these subtle differences about attitude towards the church, about the way one interacts with society. Um, and, you, know, you know, a simple example in, in, in Britain, as it is in France, you know, the whole debate about abortion is functionally over. So what sort of witness do we then offer? And th these are subtly different questions. And in the US, they have different resonances and possibilities, obviously, now. Um, and it's very difficult to, to get used to what the church is like in different countries. I've certainly experienced that myself. Yeah. No, but I think that this question, this question of tradition is, is super important, mm -hmm. um, especially going forward as it seems like the hyper politicization of practically all discourse yeah. begins to doesn't yeah. begin to. I mean, it already has. Yeah. 
invaded theological discourse. That doesn't help. And it's like, yeah. if we're just going to fall into tropes, then, yeah. well, we may as well admit from the outset that we've lost. Yeah, no, I th <laughs> that's really important. And, uh, you know, I think we go, this goes back to an earlier question that somehow modeling and creating patterns of discourse where we are, we learn to be properly attentive to the right things is, is absolutely central in the way that we educate ourselves and others. Um, and that may be the task of the moment. Yeah. Great. Well, again, thanks so much. Thanks for taking the time. It's been a pleasure. Um, all right. Turning then to you, the listener, uh, thanks so much for having tuned into this episode of Off Campus Conversations. Um, be sure to tune in every two weeks. I'm sure that you turn it, tune in in between those every two weeks because the other content is is great. <laughs> um, but if you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the Thomistic Institute podcast, whether on your podcast app or through YouTube. Uh, know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us. And we'll look forward to chatting with you next time at Off Campus Conversations. Mm -hmm.